Hi, everybody. Welcome to the next session. This one is about caring for others. I'll admit I had a really hard time narrowing down um, what I wanted to include in this recording. So hopefully I've picked the most useful, interesting stuff. Uh, with that, let's forge onward. Um, the reason we're talking about this as a practice for helpers is because the most effective helpers are the ones who cultivate the care that, or compassion that they have for others. Human beings have always cared about other people. It's just part of what it means to be a person. And the truth is we continue to have a poor understanding of this. Now, what we do understand about the care we have for others is improving, uh, but uh, we still have a long way to go to really get at what motivates people to care, why do they care about others, and so on. And, and really, this is something that people have wrestled with for millennia to understand and describe. In fact, we could go back about 800 years to the work and writings of Maimonides, who was a Jewish uh, philosopher and scholar of the Torah. And he, at one point, evaluated what he said were the eight levels of charity, meaning these are the, the, the eight ways that you can give uh, ranked by their moral superiority. So the best version of charity is this one, strengthening someone so that they no longer need to rely on others. Below that is giving anonymously or helping anonymously where neither the receiver nor the giver are known to each other. Below that, he ranked the giver being secret so that the giver can avoid the pride of being known as the giver. But in this case, the giver knows who the recipient is. Number four, in this case, the, the, the next best is the receiver being secret, saving the receiver embarrassment or shame of needing help. The fifth best is giving before being asked so that you see a need and you give without having to wait for somebody to ask you. Behind that is giving after being asked. There's some moral value to that, but not as much as if you had detected the need ahead of time. Number seven on his list is giving but not giving enough, where you, could, where you gave but not enough to really help or to make the needed difference. And then finally, the last kind of giving in, in, in rank of superiority is giving unwillingly. This idea of giving willingly is a really important concept that shows up over and over again in, in both philosophical and religious contexts. And I think it's no surprise that Maimonides would put this at the bottom as well. Going to a more modern evaluation of how we care for others, uh, I'll turn to Dr. Jamil Zaki, who wrote The War on Kindness, a fascinating book. And, and in it, he, he says there are, really kinds of, there are really three kinds of empathy that are studied today. Uh, three kinds of caring. One is empathy that involves sharing in others' emotions. And so this is what he calls emotional empathy. The next is sharing in other con another's concerns. And this is what he calls cognitive empathy. So this isn't you feel the same feelings that the other person is having, but you understand cognitively their concerns and recognize them as important. And then the last he calls compassion or empathic concern, and this is wishing to actually improve another person's life and experiences. Uh, Zaki and others have repeatedly indicated that this third kind, the compassion kind, is the best kind. Um, uh, research by Dr. Tanya Singer, who's a neuroscientist who studies compassion and empathy, was able to show that compassion and empathy are actually two different neurological processes, meaning that feeling what another person is feeling or cognitively understanding what they're struggling with, that's a different neurological process. It's something else that's happening in your brain compared to the experience of compassion. Her research, by the way, also shows that compassion is more sustainable, meaning that we can feel compassion for a longer period of time uh, without it wearing us out. So I wanna draw this clear distinction between empathy and compassion. Empathy is a thought or a feeling um, cognitive empathy would be the thinking kind. Emotional empathy would be the feeling kind. Compassion is different because it's an intent. It's where we turn our thought or feeling into an intended action. And that intent is what makes it a different process in the brain and a different experience for us as human beings. This matters because empathy on its own actually has some weaknesses or challenges to it that we have to recognize. One is that empathy can lead to fatigue and distress. It's very easy for us as human beings to get overwhelmed by the suffering of others. And it leads through a multi-step process that makes things worse off. 
We start by being fatigued by the emotional cost of seeing the suffering of others. Seeing people suffer is emotionally challenging and draining, and so it makes us tired. That fatigue can, be some so, can become so excessive that it leads to distress. And so we then reach a point where we're feeling helpless. Helplessness is a really negative emotion for people to feel, and often we feel it in response to the suffering of others. And so this is where you get to empathy distress. Empathic distress leads to something called depersonalization. And this is where we respond to the distressful feelings of helplessness by distancing ourselves psychologically from others. So depersonalization is where we start to see the people around us as less human. We start to engage or connect with them in less human ways. And so they become not people or not as much of people as we might have previously considered them. We do this depersonalization as a response to, emo to the empathic distress. It's a way to shed the feelings of helplessness by essentially reducing our level of concern for others. The research shows, especially in medical research, that depersonalization then leads to more mistakes in the care being provided. Doctors who measure high in depersonalization, for example, are much more likely to make mistakes in medical treatment. And so this is one of the challenges of relying on empathy alone as a driver for the good or we do for others for the care we have for others. There's also a problem in empathy in that it leads us into bias, which can have negative ethical consequences. Uh, Dr. Paul Bloom wrote this great book, Against Empathy, where he makes an argument for compassion instead of empathy. And then he points out some of the failures of relying on empathy alone. Uh, empathy makes us more likely to prefer people that are similar to us. Uh, it makes us more likely to prefer people that are closer to us. In either of these situations, we end up choosing the winners of our care or compassion uh, based on emotional feelings alone. Another problem with empathy is that it's bad at handling uh, large numbers. And so we're much more likely to feel empathy for small numbers of people where we can see and understand in more intimate ways their needs rather than, than large numbers. And this is why Stalin famously said, and I don't remember the exact language, but it was something along the lines of one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Because that one death, we know the story, we, know the, we probably know the name of the person who's died. Once we exceed the, our, you know, our sort of numerical limit on empathy, then we stop being able to have empathic feelings for others, even though they still deserve our compassion. A third challenge or weakness of empathy is the way it can lead to something called unmitigated communion. And this is where you, you generate in yourself a focus on others that's so expansive that it excludes yourself, that you stop recognizing the needs that you have and responding to your own needs. And as a result, you just focus on everybody else all the time. This is a, a, a trait that you see much more likely among women than men. And there are reasons to think that that's not necessarily biologically driven, but also socially uh, or culturally driven. Uh, unmitigated communion is associated with psychological distress and negative physical health. Uh, people who engage in this practice of, of focusing so much on others that they exclude themselves are less happy and healthy people. And uh, one of the drawbacks is that we're going to talk about all the benefits of compassion on the next slide. Unmitigated communion actually, actually destroys the potential benefits of compassion for the helper. And so it, so it actually not just leads to psychological distress and negative health, but it actually can destroy all these other benefits of compassion. And so this, so empathy, again, this is a weakness of empathy because an overemphasis on it can lead to, uh, to this trait. The benefits of compassion versus empathy, where compassion is not just an emotional resilient, uh, resonance with somebody else or a cognitive resonance with somebody else, but where compassion actually comes along with an intent to help. Even the mere intent to help can create all of these incredible benefits. It can lead to an increase in happiness, longer term survival for HIV patients, increased cooperation, better family relationships, reduced job burnout, uh, better experiences in aging, higher social connection. Patients survive longer and better when they're shown compassionate care. People experience reduced anxiety, both the recipients and the, and the providers of compassion. Students learn better. It's a buffer against stress, and people who give and receive compassion tend to be more resilient. 
And so this distinction of feeling the feelings really strongly versus just focusing on the intent to help, that creates the big difference between empathy and compassion, where compassion as a result produces all these benefits. Now, how do we get more compassion? Well, one of the things we look at is what motivates us to care. Why do we care for others? What, what's the incentive we have to care for others? Because if we can understand why people help, then maybe we can motivate more helping behavior, right? We create the right incentives that people want to help, and then more help will happen, more compassion will occur. Well, let's look at kind of a range of, of indicators, things that describe why people help, what the motives are. From biology, we see a couple really interesting uh, incentives for altruism. One is that uh, altruism, this idea of sacrificing one's own benefit to, to benefit others, is an evolutionary survival trait. Species that engage in altruistic behavior are more likely to flourish. Um, now, that may not mean that you individually are going to be better off, but maybe it means everybody of your species will be better off. You see this in all kinds of, of, of behaviors among animal species. A really interesting example of this is with prairie dogs. So prairie dogs take turns poking their head out of their underground, you know, underground like uh, uh, homes. I don't know what they're called. Warrens, maybe? Like rabbits? I don't know. But anyway, um, but prairie dogs will, will take turns looking up, uh, basically being on the lookout. And if they notice danger or predators in the area, the, the, the prairie dog on the lookout, who's visible to the predator, will start chirping, actually deliberately distracting the predator to approach them. It puts them at greater risk because, you know, they'll have to figure out a way to escape down into the hole or, or in some other way. But what it does is it draws away the predator from the other members of the prairie dog colony. And so that's an example of, of evolutionary altruism. And as a result, prairie dogs can be more abundant in nature because they can survive uh, predator attacks by allowing one to distract uh, a predator from all the others. Another really interesting biological trait that you see, especially in mammals, is called allomothering. And this is where you see animals care for young that are not their genetic descendant. So this happens a lot, for example, among elephants, and this is why I have a picture here. Elephants care collectively for the young of all the people in their group, in their troop, uh, not just for their own direct descendants. So they don't care only for their own children, they collectively care for each other's children too. That's an example of intraspecies allomothering, but allomothering can actually extend outside of species even. And this is why you sometimes see like, in fact, cuckoos take advantage of this and become a parasitic species because cuckoo mothers will lay their egg in the nest of other birds. And then the instinct of other birds is to raise and care for and feed the cuckoos. And so here uh, the cuckoos are taking advantage of this allomothering instinct even across species. Human beings do this. Anytime you've seen an animal that's suffering, like maybe you find a, a bird with a broken wing and you want to take care of it and heal it and bring it back to health, that's essentially an allomothering instinct. And so these are some biological explanations of why we're motivated to care for others. Economically, there are a lot of reasons to care. Some of them are just purely self-interested. You provide something for somebody else and then you get a financial return. Uh, but that's just really a market transaction. Uh, James Andrioni wrote about uh, at least three, he wrote about others two, but principally he wrote about these three motives or incent economic incentives for altruism. One is just what he describes as pure altruism, which is giving without any expectation of personal benefit. Uh, even he describes this as a primarily theoretical way of viewing giving and altruism. He does recognize, though, that sometimes we give because it makes us feel good, and he coined a term for this called warm glow, which is now used broadly to describe the kind of giving where you give because it makes you feel good. But he also recognizes a third kind of altruism, which is this idea of enlightened self-interest. And this is where you give with the expectation that someday the benefit of giving will come back to you. So this might be, for example, giving to a local food pantry because it reduces crime in your community, and then you benefit from living in a safer community as a result of your donation. Now, if we turn to psychology, there are several um, uh, frameworks or constructs or, or ways of looking at motives for giving, psychological motives. Two of them that are most popular in the, under the category of what we call egoistic or primarily selfish motives are negative state relief and arousal cost reward. 
negative state, the negative state relief model describes how we help others to make ourselves feel better. So it's essentially restating what Andreoni described as warm glow. But we're motivated, especially if it's because of sad feelings. So we might be sad and we recognize helping others makes us feel better. So we remove our negative state. We relieve ourselves of our negative state by helping others. The arousal cost reward model is slightly different from that because it focuses on the fact that seeing other people suffer makes us sad. And so we'll act to relieve their suffering if it means that we uh, will stop being sad from seeing them suffer. And so, but we will do that in the way that's least costly to us, meaning that whatever it takes to make it so they stop making us sad is the amount of help that we'll provide, but no more. Now, like I said, both of these are egoistic motives for giving or models of, of psychological motives for giving. The more popular one that was that was uh, created and, and put forth by Dr. Daniel Batson is, I think, today the most the most widely studied and, and most well-known psychological incentive for altruism, and it's something he called the empathy altruism hypothesis. And this is what we've already essentially described. We have an emotional response to somebody else in need, and this is the empathy we talked about. That emotional response to seeing others in need then motivates in us a desire to reduce that need, which is the altruism part of, of, of this um, of this motive. So seeing others suffer sparks in us a desire to reduce the need, not because it makes our suffering go away, but simply because we, we desire to help as a result of the empathic response. And like I said, this is one of the most popular in the psych literature, one of the most popular explanations for why people help. And Batson had to come up with creative ways to show that this was true, because otherwise, if you, if you model your experiments the wrong way, you might just be measuring the um, the the uh, the um, uh, cost reward model instead, for example, and so he came up with creative solutions to essentially invite people to help in a way where it was shown that it didn't lead to sort of personally feeling better off. Now, um, the problem with all of these, everything from the psychological to the economic to the biological descriptors of altruism, is that all of these are possible motives all the time. So it's not like in any given situation we know for sure it's one or the other. In fact, it can be multiple motives at the same time. And so if we're going to approach incentivizing compassion or care for others by using any of these, we could use all of them at once and never really know which one is working. We might use one, but another one is actually, is, is actually happening at the same time. And so the problem with having all these different descriptors and motives of giving or of helping others is that it's hard to sort of disentangle what's actually going to work in a given situation. Now, this problem may be fixable if we want to really incentivize more giving. Maybe what we need to do is stop looking at motives for giving, but to start look at this idea of how we define ourself. Now, in psychology, one of the, this was an older framework that's kind of been resurrected in the last 10 or so years is looking at this idea of other-centeredness, meaning that we can find ourselves in positions where we start considering the needs of others as equal to our own. So we start to look at the needs of other people and think, boy, that need is as important as my need, so I'm going to act accordingly. And so what that does is that in induces compassion and cooperation. And then what happens is we engage in this other-centeredness because we value the relationships that come from cooperation by sort of letting the needs of others penetrate how, how we evaluate our own needs, we then recognize that it sort of creates a richer experience for all of us. Now, taking this idea a step further, we get something called self-expansion theory, which is pioneered by Dr. Arthur Aaron and Dr. Elaine Aaron. They're a married couple who spend most of their lives researching romantic relationships. But this idea of self-expansion theory applies to other types of close relationships as well. And essentially, self-expansion theory says that we want to increase our self-efficacy. And self-efficacy can mean lots of things, but it could be improving your skills, improving your mental health, improving your physical health. Self-efficacy is essentially becoming more and better, becoming more of the person you want to be, a better version of the person you want to be. Well, one of the ways we can do that is through close relationships. By inviting others into a close relationship with us, by engaging in close relationships, the, we essentially extend or expand our efficacy because we incorporate the good things of the other person. 
So for example, research shows that if you marry a person that's funnier than you, it's probably going to make you funnier. And my wife would tell you that's exactly what happened in our marriage. And to no surprise for you, she is the funnier one than me. <laughs> but, but the idea is that we sort of start to incorporate or benefit from the attributes and qualities and skills and experiences of this other person, integrating them into ourself, and thereby expanding ourselves in all these meaningful and rewarding ways. They actually developed this really interesting measure for this that's been used many, many, many times in, in probably hundreds of studies now, which is called the in inclusion of others in self measure. And essentially you show people these seven sets of concentric, of increasingly concentric circles. And then you ask, okay, think about so-and-so in your life, which set of circles best describes you? And you'll see that the idea is that this other person begins to overlap an identity to such a dramatic way that it indicates the relational closeness that we have with others. Well, the beauty of this is as you incorporate this other person into your life, you essentially become more than you would be on your own, the self-efficacy idea. So examples of how we might engage in self-expansion other than through romantic relationships, having or adopting children is a way of expanding ourselves. We become parents, right? This is a role or identity we take on that we didn't have before. Becoming a worshiper in a congregation makes us a church member. And so here's another way we expand our identity by incorporating others into our own self and then acquiring the role of supervising others. I'm a leader. All of these are examples of how we can expand ourselves by creating these self-expansive relationships. Now, adding one more layer to this idea of sort of redefining self is a thought that comes from a philosopher named Peter Singer, who's easily one of the most inf influential philosophers today. He's a utilitarian philosopher, so he believes that the thing that matters most is creating the greatest happiness for the greatest number of beings. He, he doesn't think that happiness is exclusive to human beings. Any, any creature that can experience happiness has moral relevance to us. Back in the early 80s, he wrote a book called The Expanding Circle, where he made the philosophical argument, the moral argument, that as human beings have been able to have become aware of more and more others who are capable of happiness and also capable of suffering, that we are recognizing now that we have a rational requirement to start to care about all these other beings. The, the idea essentially is that, uh, you know, in, in, in times far past in history, you might have lived in a village where you only knew 100 people. And that might would be the most number of people you would ever know in your entire life. And so in that case, you could have a really tight circle of moral concern, as Peter Singer describes it. But now we live in a day and age where you're capable of experiencing more suffering than probably anybody, who, than any time ever in history. In one day, you could encounter, come across through news articles, social media, or other resources, you could come across the suffering of literally billions of creatures. And, uh, and Singer's point is, is, it, it, is that our reason compels us to care about all these other beings just as much as we care about the hundred that are closest to us. In fact, he points out that this, this rational understanding of suffering being bad and we should respond to it requires this. He said in this book, reason is inherently expansionist and it seeks universal application. So if we reasonably conclude that suffering of one individual is bad, then we might reasonably extend that to, to consider that suffering of any or all individuals is bad. Now that's a very utilitarian perspective and there's actually really, there are really interesting counter arguments to the badness of suffering and how, whether, and, and, and when and what context suffering is actually bad in a moral sense. Um, but taking all of these ideas, I want to kind of summarize it with this slide, and I want you to think about what counts as you, right? Because what could count as you is just a very tight circle, right? It's you, it's your body, it's your mind, it's your, it's your desires, whatever. Most of us don't draw a circle of you, that, like a circle defining us that's as tight as this. Most of us draw a circle that's more expansive to include more people. Um, you know, the, our romantic partners, our family members, our friends and neighbors, uh, classmates, we, a lot of us draw our circle to be more expansive, to start to include other people, basically integrating their needs and desires in the other centeredness idea and recognizing that their needs and desires are at least partly as important as our own. Well, if we're going to follow the singer perspective or argument here, 
what we are morally compelled to do is to expand that circle even further, to recognize that the needs of others that we may even never meet are as important as our own. And, and this idea of how big of a circle we draw that defines us is a way to create sustainable and engaged forms of caring for others. And so this is what I argue is the most potent way to care for others, is to create an expansive definition of self that includes the needs of, needs of others into, into as it being important as your own needs. Now, obviously, that requires balancing, and that's a huge thing to take on. I mean, what does it mean to live a life where billions of human beings matter to you as much as you matter to yourself? I'm not sure in a practical sense that's true, because really, how can we possibly care for billions of beings all at the same time? And this takes us back to the problem that we recognize uh, with Paul Bloom, right? Small numbers are more, are, are more emotionally resonant than large numbers. Well, there are some ways to stretch our circle, right? In a practical sense, to stretch our circle of self to, to reach more people. One of them is through this idea of dispositional compassion. Researchers dis d distinguish between what's called situational compassion, which is where you have a compassionate response to a particular set of circumstances. Normally, you wouldn't seek out or care about a problem, but in a specific moment, it tugs especially your heartstrings, induces an intent to help, and so you act accordingly. So you act out on that compassion. But something else that can be developed is this idea of dispositional compassion. And this is where we create in ourselves a tendency to respond with compassion across a wide range of circumstances. In ourselves, we can cultivate an instinct for compassion so that it becomes dispositional to us rather than just dependent on the situation. And just to remind you here, we're talking about compassion where we have an empathic concern for somebody else's suffering that leads to a desire to alleviate that suffering. So it's the feeling leading to an intent. What's cool about dispositional compassion is that a lot of the research shows that it predicts a lower likelihood of depressive symptoms that leads to less job strain at work. You, you're, you have better cognitive well-being, you encounter more social support in your life, you have greater life satisfaction, and you're more optimistic if you're a dispositionally compassionate person. So there are a lot of selfish incentives to develop this kind of compassion. So how do we develop greater compassion? Probably one of the most interesting and one, one of the, right now uh, one of the most compelling research uh, topics in this space has to do with loving kindness meditation. Matthew Ricard is a former uh, PhD biologist who uh, became a Buddhist monk. Uh, he's a strong proponent of loving kindness meditation, not only because it leads to greater compassion, but also to greater happiness and well-being. And he's written extensively about this. But essentially, a regular loving kindness meditation practice, and you guys are going to do this as, as the exercise for this week, it increases our compassion and, and empathy and social connection and our helping behavior all in sustainable ways. In fact, it's cool because the research so far indicates that even a short period of loving kindness meditation, meaning lasting just a couple of weeks, can sustainably increase all the things on that first bullet. It also has strong personal benefits. People who engage in loving kindness meditation have, uh, have better symptoms relative to things like migraines, chronic pain, PTSD, and other things. So it's actually a positive health practice too. Uh, I do want to point out that there are indicators that compassionate prayer is an equivalent practice to loving kindness meditation. So you don't have to necessarily meditate uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a strict way. But, the, but there are indicators that if the way you engage in this loving kindness meditation is actually through prayer, meaning pray, praying for others and extending the circle of people for whom you pray, that the, you, can, you can create the loving kindness feelings for other parties. And this is really how loving kindness meditation works. You start by cultivating or recognizing this feeling of love and care that you have for someone close to you. And then through meditation, you extend that loving kindness that you're feeling to other individuals as well. Uh, let's go on, though. Deliberate self-expansion is another way to increase your compassion. And, and so expand yourself by creating more meaningful relationships. Uh, you can do this by shared activities. If there's a specific person in your life that you're having a hard time loving, then this is an especially helpful slide for you. And these are ways that you can be better at this, the first two in particular. So 
one of the most potent ways to increase self-expansion, which deepens your compassion for the other person, is to engage in shared activities that are novel, challenging, or interesting. So it's not just spending time, but it's spending time in ways like this. Something new and exciting, something that's challenging or that pushes you, or something that you both find really interesting. These kind of, um, and here psychologists would use the word arousing, not in a sexual way, but like arousing our interests and, uh, and, and emotions. Um, here, are these sort of, these, these kinds of activities, exciting activities, uh, can actually deepen the sense of self-expansion, deepen the, the, the relationship, and therefore the compassion we feel. Another thing that really works well is supporting the partner in individual expanding activities. So one of the best ways you can help a person that's close to you is to support them in things that, that they find exciting or interesting, even if they go do them on their own. And partners who, who feel supported this way feel a deeper sense of connection and compassion for the ones who's supporting them and vice versa. But outside of close relationships like romantic relationships, another way to engage in self-expansion is by making friends with these out-group individuals. Make a friendship, develop a friendship with someone who's not like you. Uh, these sorts of friendships are really powerful in extending our empathic concern for others. It's not mere exposure to people that are different from us that matters. What the research tends to show is that it's developing meaningful relationships with people that are different from others. So just sort of being in the same neighborhood as people different than you isn't quite enough. You have to find ways to develop relationships with those people, and that's when it has the positive effect. Suffering can actually be a source of in increased compassion. Uh, this is something that's, that's, that's described as true in a lot of spiritual uh, traditions. Um, but there is research that shows that the greater the suffering, the higher the potential level of dispositional compassion. So if people have had really hard experiences in their life, they, the research shows they gain a deeper capacity for dispositional compassion. You'll, now you'll notice I've described this as a capacity because this is only true, suffering leads to this compassion only if the suffering is followed with empathy and something called post-traumatic growth. You've heard probably post-traumatic stress which is the, the sort of distressing, uh, psychologically damaging ways we can carry on after a hard experience. Uh, Post-traumatic growth is, a, is an alternative to that where we increase our resiliency, our self-efficacy after a hard experience. If you engage in post-traumatic growth, uh, getting help, for example, from a professional, and you then take that suffering experience and let it cultivate empathy for others who suffer a similar experience, then your suffering can, the research shows, lead to dispositional compassion. In fact, you can think of suffering as a way that actually expands the self because the hard experience you have is a hard experience that somebody else has probably had or will have. And you incorporate them into this self by this shared experience of suffering. Even if you didn't share the same moment of suffering, sharing the same kind of suffering can have this positive effect as long as the suffering is followed by empathy and, and growth. Systematic, sorry, system, systemic compassion is another way to improve compassion. And if you think about how to improve compassion in an organization, there are ways to do it systematically. For example, you can train people in compassionate expressions. There's research in the medical field that shows that training doctors on a 15 second script where they express compassion before providing care can it create all the benefits of compassionate care. <laughs> and so even if the doctor doesn't feel it or mean it, the mere expression of compassionate uh, feeling or concern can create the benefits as though the doctor actually did care. And so training managers, for example, to engage in compassionate expressions can produce the benefits of compassion. And there are indicators that leads to the, to the manager or doctor feeling more compassion. Uh, you can embed processes for people to share their needs within organizations. And so if people have a need and they have a pathway to share it, <clears throat> it creates more opportunities for expressions of compassion in word or deed. In fact, the research shows that the, most, that the, 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 the strongest predictor of help is if somebody asked for help. And if people don't have the opportunity to ask, then you'll see less compassion and care. And so creating op more opportunities for people to share their needs is a way to increase compassion in a systematic way. And then finally, rewarding compassionate behavior works. And there's research that shows that if you demonstrate, hey, this is a compassionate person, we're recognizing them for their compassion, that it will incentivize compassion in others. 
The last compassion practice I want to talk about is practicing what's called gratitude and awe. Compassion is in a family of, of experiences we call self-transcendent uh, uh, states. And so compassion is a self-transcendent state, meaning it takes you beyond just yourself, right? Self-expansion, all the things we've talked about. Gratitude and awe are also self-transcendent states. And there's some research that shows, and this is a study done with nurses, that a daily grat gratitude practice increased what was called compassion satisfaction, meaning that they found more meaning um, and, and emotional uh, strength that came from compassion if they engaged in, uh, in, in this case, the study was they wrote down the three things they're grateful for every day. And there are other indicators that gratitude can lead to compassion. It's not quite as strong as like loving kindness meditation, but it can increase our compassion for others because of this self-transcendent. And that's true for awe as well. Awe is this state of sort of feeling small in a big world, but in a positive way, like seeing our, seeing beauty and amazement and other things that go far beyond ourselves. If you've stood on a mountaintop, you know what I mean, right? That's what awe is. And there's research that indicates, multiple studies that indicate that experiencing awe creates this self-transcendence, which then leads to pro-social behavior. So you're more likely to think about others and care for others because the experience of awe gets you outside of yourself. So just going to a beautiful place or listening to beautiful music can have the effect of making you more compassionate, which I just think is awesome. Now, I realize this was an especially long video. I hope you like watched it on double speed if that was helpful. But like I said, I was going to have a hard time including everything. So here we are. Uh, in class, we're going to talk through some of these ideas. And then with the time we have left, we're going to talk about spiritual principles that can help us care more for others. And I really look forward to that conversation.